Okay, so we're yeah. going to start the panel a couple of minutes early because yeah, then we can just Polish. have more fun Quickly, with it. Kind of um, I've been a bit opinionated with the panel, so I've looked through all the questions that people posted. Um, and effectively what I've done is I've picked out questions and put them into topics. I, I, I did some preparation, which is really unlike me. I know, like, <laughs> Hank's like, what? Um, and so what I figured is what, was the co what conversation would I want to have with you guys if we were sitting down having a beer? And I thought that would work better if we had a beer. So. The sitting down part. We can pretend we're sitting down. But I thought we couldn't fake beer. That's not okay. <laughs> so. So uh, first question is a bit meta and it's more of an observation really. That says, I don't know if it's the best place to post it, but do you think posting questions to an app is agile? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I quite like that. I'm not sure I necessarily want an answer, but I thought I'd share that with you. Um, I'm going to start with, right, there's also hundreds, well not hundreds, several questions. So we'll go sort of back and forth along the panel, um, but reasonably quickly, unless it's something you really want to climb into, in which case go nuts. So people stuff. Um, there's, and I love that, you, that there's a tone to some of these questions that kind of comes along in the, across in the question, so I'm going to just read them verbatim. What do you mean, so this is, I presume it to Hank, what do you mean you make all your engineers speak in public? Is this real life? <laughs> question mark. <laughs> <laughs> Said in horror, aghast. In horror. I think I uh, talked to the guy uh, outside. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> and... I told them, hey, if you look, uh, you will see that there was this little diamond shape to how we want our engineers to rate and speaking and writing tutorials is especially a skill that we require for proficient and expert. And then he said, but I don't want my engineers to speak uh, and be very great at that because then they might leave. <laughs> So then we had a discussion uh, where I said, hey, you're keeping them down, my friend, right? Is that right? They could be so much more than they are today. I talked to Adrian quickly and he said, we need to get, there's so many talented people out there, we need to stop uh, wasting their talent, right? So the, the big question is, I think, how do we get uh, to a place where we can nurture people's skills and have them all become awesome. Yeah, I think, uh, I forgot your name, my friend, even though you gave me three cigarettes already today, so thank you for that. <laughs> I hope my wife is not listening to this. <laughs> don't smoke, uh, kids. Yeah, don't smoke. But, um, but yeah, that's really the discussion. Are we, do we really want to spend energy and time nurturing the skills of uh, our engineers? Fantastic, thank you. Does anyone else want to speak to that in terms of getting your people out speaking in public? At WeaveWorks, this is compulsory. Um, and I think it's similar to the attitude displayed by Rachel. Um, where this kind of owning live is another aspect of this. Owning the customer experience in a live application, if that's what you're responsible for developing, goes hand in hand and things like documenting it, talking about it with people. And if you're not willing to do that, then we don't want you to be in our team. We, uh, I've got, a, I've got, yeah, I've got a mic here. Um, <laughs> we don't force people, but <coughs> what we do instead is say to people, well, you know, you will probably in your career need to speak to people. You will need to stand up in front of people. This would be good to practice, and you could practice it in a safe environment. So having tech talks back at the office where you're just talking to your colleagues, that's an easy way to do it. Running a meeting. So, I mean, there are some people who really get paralysed just to stand in front of a whiteboard and talk to their teammates. But if you do it enough times, you realize it's not that bad. And I think just supporting people is quite important. Yeah, it's a skill. You can learn it. So uh, an example of that, I had a team. I was coaching a very small team, like four people. And part of what they were doing is the first ever Agile anything. And so I said, OK, so you guys are going to demonstrate progress at your showcase. OK, so there's going to be a showcase. There'll be business people along, and you'll show them what you did. And they're like, Color drains out their face, right? So the first time they first time they do this, they are kind of, uh, oh, we, we did this thing and there's a screen, and the business sponsor's like, wow, you did that in a week, 
Like normally I'd be seeing diagrams of that in three months, right? And you've done that in a way, and they're going, yes. <laughs> and then like, so now the second week, you know, second showcase, they're like, well, this week we did this and this and blah. And, and, and they're feeling quite pleased about progress because people aren't used to seeing progress and that was going well. And then the third week, this guy starts bringing his buddies along, right? other, other business guys saying, look at what these guys can do. So now there's like three, by about, well, I was there for eight weeks coaching them and by the eighth showcase, it was a show, right? They would come on and they were presenting and they had the thing and a big screen and there were probably 30 people, nothing to do with the project, two people actually on the project, everyone else going, blindly, where can we get some of this? And, and yeah, you're right, it's a learnable skill and they were enjoying it themselves. They were having fun, they were energized. Um, there's a really sad corollary to this story, uh, which is then, uh, so we, I, I left and, and they carried on doing this thing and then the project basically said, oh, it was a great pilot, it was successful, we learned a load of stuff. Right, you two go back into that team and you go into there and you go over there and carry on doing what you used to do. Two of them promptly quit. <laughs> um, and went and worked for much, much more enlightened companies. Uh, one of them, the last time I saw him, was looking just a little bit haggard and sad, uh, and I lost track of the other one. But yeah, so the whole thing just dissipated back. But yeah, it's definitely a learnable skill. Cool, hurrah. Um, now, oh, okay, so there's a similar sort of thing there. This is about changing people. So Hank, Hank at the end, of, <laughs> while he was speaking, there were just questions coming in. There's about 40 questions just on his page. So there's lots of uh, sort of change and scaling things. Um, Tips for engaging developers who are working within the Agile framework. I'm not sure the, the Agile framework's a thing, but we'll go with it. Um, but seemingly do not see the big picture or reason why we're adopting this. So, so, so tips, can, what, what tips would you give for uh, engaging developers who are kind of, they're in this sort of transitional thing or some big transformation and they're not getting it, they don't see the big picture and they're lost? What, how, how can, how, what, what tips would you give for engaging with those people? I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Other than um, this famous article I read from, of course, again, Netflix, where, which basically said if some engineer is failing to get the context, then some manager has failed, uh, or some engineer makes an error, then some manager has failed to give the correct context. Right, so I think IT managers should be able to transmit the right context and make people uh, feel enthusiastic about this agile adventure. Cool. Is that an answer, or what about the ones that don't? There's always a body count, right? So, can, can I yeah. chip in? So, I think so. You Forget the Agile framework and getting excited about the Agile framework, but maybe just getting people to talk to users that are using something they've made and like actually seeing them use it and how, and how bad it potentially might be <laughs> uh, can often... Uh, I think often software developers are motivated by problems. So if you show them the bigger problem rather than being isolated from that problem, that can engage people. If they understand why we're worried and why we're trying to do something different. Can it also maybe terrify them or paralyze them or freak them out or something? How do you know which I, news to, to shout to protect and which to... I think if you... This is why I say just get introduce them to people who are actually using the software because sometimes those people are not the scary high up people. They're usually the lowly people who are just trying to go, I just wanted to do this and I can't. And... and Meeting somebody who has a genuine problem that you think, oh, I could probably fix that, might help people to kind of go, oh, it's not about this big agile transformation plan. It's more probably about connecting with people who work in our business or people who work Ooh. outside. Okay. I've seen this problem um, in a company I used to work for, which specializes in pretty XP style agile development. And there was a rule that if you interacted with members of the team who were doing this, you had to work in their way, which a lot of the developers in the team that I was associated, affiliated with found extremely difficult and frustrating because they, they, there was one particular thing they absolutely did not want to do, and that was pair programming. And it wasn't just ordinary pair programming where we all sit in front of a screen. It was replicated screens. You know, Each person has a mouse, but it controls one pointer. 
all of the whole thing. And um, they just found it to be slow. They didn't like necessarily working at the same speed as another person. So in that situation, we had a problem because you had two dif different teams with totally different cultures. Now, the objective was to get them to work together, not to necessarily adopt each other's practices wholesale. So the solution in that case is not to make to force people to do something they really don't want to do, but instead to go to the question behind the question and say, what are we trying to achieve here? And what we were trying to achieve was collaboration. So what we, a lot of the people ended up being happy just sitting next to another programmer for a day or two, working with them side by side, not necessarily always doing identical things, but just actually going through the code, having walkthroughs and discussions. And that was kind of an icebreaker. And a few, a few people, not all, after that were happy to try out the replicated screens thing, some liked it, some didn't, but the point was that we actually moved forward after that. So I think not being too stuck in the mud about those things is good. Yeah. So I want to try and get a bit of a discussion and a bit of contention going. So I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna think about that as we talk. I've got a question for, specifically for Frank, but I think we can broaden it out because it's in the general theme of testing. But um, this, I love this. How did you test that it would work with big crowds? Right? Because because you can't just get 100,000 well. test people together. So it says, I guess when you are developing, you only had a small number of uh, wristbands or people to test with. Yeah, there, there's a fine Is it working. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. a fine line between testing and at some point it goes into praying. <laughs> because in all honesty, you don't really know. Uh, we had like uh, we had a limited number of wristbands. At some point, we just put some wristbands on and went into the, into the city when it was crowded to figure out because human bodies also make a difference. Uh, and in the end, like a uh, music festival is in wireless terms, the most noisy place on the planet. They're like huge, like a 40,000 watt amp is gonna cause some interference. Or everything that's there and you can't replicate it. You can't do that in a lab. So at some point, it is just scary. So and how, how, do, I mean, how do you mitigate that? Do you just say, right, we're just gonna go with this and see what happens or? Well, yeah, at some point, you just have to bite the bullet, right? <laughs> you just get on and, 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 and print 100,000 watches. Yeah, I think, yeah, what, I what think it works. What question are you asking? Well, so, so, so the, the, the question was, how, how do you, what kind of testing do you do so that you're a bit more confident that when you put it, give it to 100,000 people in a festival, it's going to be OK? Well, yeah, we do as, as much as we can, but we can't have 100,000 people. So we can do all kinds of tests on the wristband individually, on the software, on the hardware and also just testing if it stays together for long enough. But yeah, there is gonna be a difference between a music festival and your test setup. And that's something you have to accept and take a deep breath. <laughs> and move on. Fantastic, and then a, a very quick one. A great talk uh, to Frank. Does the wearable watch actually show the time? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was a nice quick question. Um, so, okay, something hopefully a little bit contentious. Uh, I need a more than one word answer here. Uh, do you think containers are going to make Java app servers redundant or irrelevant? It's interesting because we've got an OSGI guy and we've got a couple of Java people, so. Who asked that question? <laughs> um, and if you're one of our, our co-sponsor IBM, you might want to look away now. Uh, <laughs> the app server has made itself redundant by growing into incredible complexity. Um, it's been replaced by things, first by Tomcat, which is a kind so of going to do server that now. Java, and then by Spring Boot, which has got rid of the app server completely, just in the JVM. It's got nothing to do with containers. What containers are doing is they're standardizing deployment, which is one layer down in the stack that I drew. So I think, you know, there's a bunch of trends going on at the same time, not quite in sync, uh, of which, you know, I think you're, you're touching on a bunch of themes with, with, with your question. But I, I don't think the container itself is going to make the app server redundant. I think it, the app server has done a really good job on its own. <laughs> well, uh, I, I do think that like uh, app servers like Tomcat were used as containers to separate different apps, right? You can mm -hmm. run sev separate apps. Not in say, Tomcat, but anyway. <laughs> well, kind of. You can Universal deploy. class path. Yeah, <laughs> true. But uh, I think that works a lot better with containers. I think you can't really trust two, uh, two different apps you don't really trust in the same J JVM. Actually, I think. sorry, another point, which is uh, a technical point, is that 
with containers, you'll see people building more distributed applications. That was the point of the cloud native stack story. Um, most Java app servers presume a very restricted notion of a distributed app, which essentially is the old layer cake style. I mean, they exist because people wanted to replicate the business model developed by Jeff Bezos and Amazon. That's why the demo app was pet store. Uh, anyone else want to offer anything? Hank's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so there's a regulatory thing here, and I'm interested, especially on the, on the hardware side, because there's a whole bunch of things you have to jump through as well in terms of getting something, a physical device that you can mass produce and put on people's wrists at a, at a, at a venue. But the question here is, uh, have you, and it was, at, it was aimed to hang, so in a banking environment, but I think it's a broader thing than that. Have you, uh, how have you met some of the regulatory or compliance challenges on your agile journey? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking very quickly now if I am uh, being very naughty by telling this story. Um, so, I've got this friend that works at a Dutch bank. <laughs> <laughs> and he told me. <laughs> and the European Central Bank came to visit. <laughs> the end. Yeah. And they send a couple of smart Alex um, with their preconceived notions of how things should be done. So question number one is, where is your test department? <laughs> and I told them quite to friendly, we have no test department. <laughs> so I saw his pencil go to the box. <laughs> <laughs> he has no test department. <laughs> yeah. So I said, if you're interested, I will tell you how a continuous delivery pipeline works and how we gather the evidence that everything has been tested before it can go to production. And he made the, made the mistake of saying, oh yeah, please tell me. <laughs> <laughs> so I explained to him in horrendous detail for two hours how that worked. Um, one of the two had difficulty keeping awake. <laughs> so I wasn't that entertaining, obviously. But I think they accepted, uh, at the end, to their credit, uh, that we had a, a different way of doing testing without having a test department. Um, and I have not heard new questions since. <laughs> which could be that they are still studying on <laughs> how to tackle this, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Is this an answer to the question, really? Yeah? So I think, I used to work in the bank once. Um, the issue with financial regulation is one where people have a transactional presupposition about everything that you do. So they assume that everything is a transaction, meaning that once Sorry. it's committed, Alexis, can you lift the mic you can't go back. Hard mic up a bit. You can't go back. Um, so they think that, they don't understand concepts like rollback. Or, you know, if we commit this change to the app and we made a we can just take it away and, and do something else. It's, it's really alien to them. So my recommendation for dealing with these people, if they ever come around to your office, is to ask them, what do you think about Bitcoin? And then when they run around the room screaming, you can go and back, back to what you were doing. <laughs> I'm interested in... <laughs> Frank, what do you do in terms of like uh, regulation and, and all that? Stuff. I don't really know there's a lot. I mean, there, there, there are some things that need to be done, but generally they are, uh, yeah, you, you have to get... So yeah, FCC compliance and those kind of things. Exactly, yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. But that's not like a huge hurdle. It's more like a it's part, like part of the manufacturing process or yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, basically that. Cool. Okay. So it's much more systemized. Yeah, I should um, say another thing, sorry. Um, don't apologize, you're on a panel, that's what you're here for. There's a lot of companies that, that we've been speaking about today, these sort of um, pioneers like Netflix and so on, are consumer-facing companies with big web presences which do things like take details, personal details of customers online and hold them in trust. And they are perfectly able to commingle agile practices with strong compliance around holding their consumers' personal details. So if they can do it, so can everybody else. I would agree. I think there's some, something I found as well, I've worked in a bunch of financial uh, places now, is there's 
So regulatory and compliance are two very different things. So um, <coughs> regulatory is tends to be uh, we would like you to provide this information, or we would like you to, if we ask you this question, you'll have an answer for it. So things like uh, client money is a popular one, right? Which of the money in your pot is your money, and which of the pot money in your pot is someone else's money, because you need to know that. And the way people engage those things is very much on a scale, right? So um, I've seen some institutes that will, uh, that will remain nameless that, that are kind of, they know that if they haven't got an answer by X point in time, they're going to get a fine. And they say, well, that fine is one possible option, right? And that's a cost of business if we don't do that. And if we do do this thing, how much is it going to cost to be compliant? We'll take the fine this quarter and we'll have it done by next quarter or something. It's a commercial decision. Um, a lot of places I find they, or a lot of places misunderstand compliance rules um, in a way that means that they overcompensate. So things like Sarbanes Oxley, I've seen. Uh, so sort of very, very integrated teams, completely compliant with Sarbanes-Oxley. Because Sarbanes-Oxley says two pairs of eyes need to have seen something and need to have approved something so that it can go into production. It doesn't say you need to have a hermetically sealed operations and release group. That's how everyone implements it, and then they go, oh, you can't do Agile in a, in a regulated environment. It's like, well, you can't do it in that regulated environment because you're, you're, not, you're not talking to the people. This discussion I really recognize. Um, it was translated uh, to us as the separation of duties yes. uh, thing. And we told them, well, um, as the deployment is completely done by pushing on this button, so this system, basically, with the, which does the deployment, is separated from the guy who writes the code, so done. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. We didn't get away with it. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Compensating control. Yeah, but that's a different thing. Right? If everything is auditable, it is. We've made sure of that. Yeah. yeah no, I think that's the thing, is that you can design in auditability in the same way you can design in securability. So talk about the rugged thing. So security is a characteristic of a system. Securability is a characteristic of the design. Auditability, monitorability, all of those illities are choices you make when you're building something. Okay. Another thing about this, I think um, just what people have said in the last few minutes has made me realize that if, if it's a Sarbox style philosophy where two individual autonomous agents have to sign off on something for it to go through, it's a lot like pair programming, code review, you could argue that all of the uh, philosophies of regulation are sort of baked in at a very deep and fine-grained level at, uh, in agile development. So what is what, why, does it, why then is it challenging? I think perhaps it's because the regulatory mindset is one of wanting to point the finger at an individual and say, it was your fault. You were accountable. And you, you can't do that when it's the process that's replaced the person to, to deliver quality. And I think that's quite, quite mentally challenging, but, but a good thing. Still want to react to that, um, especially in the light of the rugged discussion that we had yesterday, right? We have to assume that one of our colleagues is or can be brought into a position where he or she does something that is not allowed. And then we have to catch it. Um, and that's really a thing today. And for a bank, it absolutely is a thing. So of course, we have our measures in place for that. Um, and increasingly so. And I think this is going to be a thing for many, many uh, teams who write software. So being able to at least detect that somebody did something at, um, that could potentially be harmful and that that event triggers somebody to have a look at it immediately. Um, all these kinds of measures will become more and more part of <coughs> continuous delivery. Um, and the pipelines that we're building. It was an, uh, a learning experience for me, really, when we built the central pipeline, how many of our risk people really were uh, interested in, hey, how do you build this? Whereas for them, it was also unmanageable when everybody did their own uh, continuous delivery and their own, had their own build servers. But as soon as we created this central thing, it felt like everybody was hitting on me to make it perfectly perfect from the from day one 
Um, well, that happens too. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, certainly in your talk, there's like you can see that there's an arc of, of as as different things evolve as you as you pick your battles, which things you're going to tackle now, which things you're going to sit on for some years because the other stuff needs to bed in. Yeah. So. Uh, Okay, so there's more questions about kind of scaling and change and that kind of stuff. Um, so, <clears throat> actually, <laughs> I'll just, I'm just going to read this one out. I love this. Uh, this, again, is, is for Hank, but I think the, the, it, it does apply to the other guys as well. All this IT focus, are you still running a bank? <laughs> or has your, well, no, and then, the, and then the, 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 the payoff part of the question, or has your business evolved into something else? I think a bank is IT and IT is the bank. Is it an answer? So what's different? It's got me thinking. <laughs> no, more and more, ah, this sounds like big phrases, so I feel a little bit awkward, but um, I can see that, that a large part of the population that is actually driving uh, and building software for our customers is our IT folks, right? And they are, uh, very much part of the discussion of the, uh, what the next feature will be because they know from a technology perspective what's important and they're more and more interested in what our customers say about their product. So having this very direct feedback loop, for example, from the app stores where customers either complain or have suggestions and uh, today even developers are reacting to that uh, or giving their comments really, really helps. It's a form of engagement and a form for them to understand what is valuable in their app or not. I'm not sure if there's this bigger difference anymore. I think also the, when you start to blur the edges of teams and start to blur the edges of organizational boundaries, the, certainly the, 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 the successful technologists I've seen in banks understand banking. That's the thing that they do. So I've been, I worked in trading firms where you've got programmers who understand the, the domain of trading as well as the traders. And then the traders are going, I'm going to learn me some Python so I can put some ideas together and show you guys. And you can go and turn that into a product. And you get this fantastic cross-fertilization going on. So I think that's where we're going. Yes, we're still running a bank. Uh, we're still having a banking license. Um, <laughs> that's a pretty good indicator right there. And we intend to have that one for a long, long time. Fantastic. There's, there's a big difference between traders and bank customers. So. Um, you know, you can think of a business as a collection of APIs for interacting with it. It has customers. The customers are there to buy things from it or to put money into it to, you know, to execute some kind of action. And those interfaces that consumers are using are like APIs and more and more that they actually are APIs. So it's natural if the customer experience is digital to think of them as IT problems that need to be solved. But I think the trader is in a very different situation because they're usually inside the bank making decisions on behalf of the bank as to what risk to take. So it's a slightly different thing. I wouldn't mm -hmm. commingle the two. That's true. And I think there's, there's something there about understanding all the different stakeholders involved. So you've got the upstream guys in the business, the downstream guys in operations. You've got the customers out there who are, and you have many, many different types of customer. And your, as you say, it's a bunch of APIs. Your engagement with each of those is something that's going to be a, a function of time, I think, as the bank changes. Marvelous. So, OK. Um, and I, I suspect, sorry, these are all for Hank, but these, uh, these, uh, these you, guys, you other guys, please jump in. Um, there's, uh, there's a reason this is fairly obviously. How do you get talent to join your company? OK, pause especially in fields that are considered stuffy, dull, or boring, <laughs> right? Uh, like making awesome watches to hand out to people at festivals. No, like banking, finance, insurance, that kind of thing. <laughs> well, Ra Rachel, you can speak to this as well. I know you've done a bunch of... Uh... Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Like yeah. corporation. Yeah, like news corporation. <laughs> well, having, That's having... media, darling. That's cool. Having one day a week to do whatever you like is kind of a cool way to attract people. Um, but we do, I think there are people who are drawn to the idea of collaborative working. There are also people who don't like that kind of thing. And so if we make it really, really clear that the way we work is collaborative and we kind of get out there and we have a meet, we host a meet up and we put posts out and talks about what we're doing, it helps people to understand 
oh, that's what I would be getting myself into if I did go there. And it's kind of part of the interview process. So you, you, if you didn't like pair programming, you would walk out in the pair programming interview, as we have occasionally had people do. Uh, but it, it, it's, it, if you make it clear this is the kind of world you're going into, then people can decide whether they subscribe to that and want to be part of it or not. I think, yeah, I agree. I think a lot of it's branding as well. There's uh, a, another conference in London I was at last year, yeah. last year, maybe year before, where uh, Bank of America, so big conservative, you know, American yeah, bank yeah. type thing, had a stand. And it wasn't like, a, you know, come and work at Bank of America. They were all gleaming Macs, and they had yeah. written a Python challenge thing with a bunch of stages, and the last stage was timed, and it had a leaderboard. Right? And there's like, it's a, you know, it's a geek conference, and this thing was buzzing the whole time. And there's other folks who are other sponsors who are going, oh, come and look, here's a, here's a free spongy thing, right? Oh. And they're going, how fast can you hack on Python? They're going, let me just find out. And, and it sends a very different message. Yeah, and, and I think it, people muddle the app you build with how interesting it is to build it. Uh, you know, just because something's being used at festivals doesn't mean it's like exciting code. It might be. I think it probably is. But <laughs> do, you know, do you see what I mean? Yeah. There, there is, you don't, and just because it's in banking doesn't mean it's not exciting. Like, well, they've yeah. got some very interesting challenges, so it makes it hard. So hard problems are what people look for. Right. I completely agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, I can say something about it because I'm quite active in meetup, uh, meetups around Amsterdam, and the ING turns up quite a bit. So they are really visible there. And that's, um, for me, if I think about AING, I think, oh, they, they do, do cool stuff. I'm not looking for a job, but still, I know that in the back of my, my mind. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I think that's really good to have visibility there. I mean, that's, uh, it's always a bit of a, sometimes there are too many recruiters at the meetup nowadays. But uh, yeah, I, I think it's a good place to be. I a want a to guy who makes watches for festivals thinks your bank is a cool place to be. You should just take a moment there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm a bit put off by the question, really, um, because I don't recognize it. And, and so, thank you, this gave me a little bit of time to prepare my answer, but here it is. Um, what talented developers really want is hard challenges, uh, and to try their hands on new stuff. If I look at the amount of new stuff that we have rolled into the bank in the last two years, it's amazing. Um, if I look at the platform that we're giving to engineers to become really great, that's truly amazing. Uh, so two of my colleagues are in Silicon Valley next week to give a keynote at the Cassandra event. Um, so. So I think a bank right now, today, in the situation that it's in, is a fantastic place to work as an engineer. There's so much, it's so easy to influence uh, the people, it's so easy to influence the course if, of, of the, the strategy if you have a great plan. It's really an awesome place to work right now. And banks have to be that, or they will be uh, poked by uh, Adrian's uh, unicorns. Right, so there's an image. So I. Th <laughs> so, so, so all I want to say is be aware of the, the unicorns with the big pointy things on their heads. But, <laughs> but hey, banks are transforming. At least ING is transforming at an amazing speed. And and if if there's something that you want to be a part of, at least, um, well, come and talk to me. Fantastic. Excellent. So, lovely panellists. One, I'd like to hear your closing comments on, a, on what do you think? Say we all assemble next year, this time, and have a beer. What will be different? What would you want to be different there would be two in beers. the world? There would be <laughs> more yeah. than one beer. I like that. But yeah, so, so what, what, what do you think is going to be different in the world in a year? Will you still be at New School Fresh? I'll be working in a much bigger company, Dan. <laughs> Who knows what the future may bring? Uh, I think it's really hard to predict. I think it's better to be able to be in a position to adapt to change and to, instead of trying to think like big, you know, where will we be now, kind of think what would be good for us to be able to do 
so that we're more flexible. So I, I tend to think if you can bring more flexibility to your approach, then that allows you to take the chance of different opportunities that come up. Fantastic. Go to Alexis. <laughs> <laughs> We will have taken over the world. <laughs> Everyone will be using it. I mean, the really important changes in technology are the ones that impact people, and they take a long time to be recognized, usually only in retrospect. I mean, I was astonished when Amazon Web Services released their actual revenue figures, and people expressed surprise at them. I mean, it was obvious to everybody who was paying attention that these guys were making money at quite high profit margins for you know, some time ago. Yet people insisted until the last possible minute that it was impossible to make money in the cloud. And all you were doing is adding a tiny percentage to you know, procuring a machine. It was, it was pathetic. So that just goes to show you how hard it is for people to understand really significant technological change. You know, there's all these uni Adrian's unicorns. So I'll use that phrase indefinitely now. <laughs> Adrian's unicorns are appearing Adrian all unicorn around herder. all the time, and people are still insisting that oh, it's. Oh look, it, problem number one has been solved. It can't be true. That's oh, what it's fantastic! Been. There we go. Way less than a year. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I mean, if you look back much. over the last 12 months, what's the most significant change in technology? Can anyone even answer that question? I can't. But I think that, um, I hope there'll be more people here. I think it's a good conference. So thanks for coming. And, um, you know, I hope we're still in business. That would be good. I think we're doing pretty well. Um, maybe working with some of you guys. And I suppose you know, the really big question in our industry, there's two questions, one at the macro level, one at the smaller level. Um, in the industry at large, there's concerns about whether the industry is overfunded. Um, I think if, if that proves to be true, and I'm not sure if it is, that will have a negative impact on all kinds of things in the way that the tech crash did in 2000 on businesses outside tech. And on a smaller scale within the world of cloud native and containers, we're all waiting for Docker to start making any real money. As soon as they do, it's going to help everybody else in the industry. So that's, that's one that I'm curious to see in the next 12 months. Thank you. You triggered me there. So there's, next year we're here again, and there's basically two topics that I would love to be, uh, to be addressed here. So one is, hey, You're taking notes. what do people actually need to learn to become great engineers fast, right? Um, I think Adrian himself has some ideas and a lot of experience on that. Uh, and the other one is, and you triggered me there, is, hey, what is this? Um, there's this lady called Carlotta Perez, and she's made a study of how uh, financial bubbles and technology bubbles uh, go together. Um, and we, that, we've seen that before. So if we could get her to also talk, Oh. There we go. Very specific shout out there. Okay. <laughs> Notes are being taken, I'm fairly sure. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, that's a tricky one. I think it's always less than we think that changes. I mean, uh, for us in, in the wearable space, if we look at the Google Glass, the Apple Watch, uh, not that much changes. I mean, people still don't want to wear the stuff. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I think it, it's less than we think. And um, there, will be, there will be changes, but slow, really slow. People are slow. I want to make one prediction. So here, here's my prediction, for not for next year, but for, let's say, 10, 15 years' time. I think right now the Okay, so we meet back here 10 or 15 years' time, <laughs> right? Three years are on Alexis, yeah? The population of software developers is about 10 million people today. I think in, it won't be long before it's 100 million people, and I think that's going to lead to some pretty fascinating changes. I think that's important. Cool. Uh, so it just remains for me to thank my panelists. Thank you very much indeed, guys. It was brilliant. Thank you.